Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, Gus Cairns, one of the editors at AIDS Map, with my fellow uh, and senior editor Roger Pevody, and we're interviewing Dr. Zida Rosenberg, who is um, chief executive. Is that who you are, director? Yes. <laughs> of the international <laughs> and, and founder, founder is founder very indeed good. of the it, international it goes to age. microbes. <laughs> Um, about uh, this very welcome announcement that the European Medicines Agency, which along with the US FDA is one of the two biggest regulators of drugs in the world, um, have licensed, uh, approved the use of the vaginal ring um, as an HIV prevention method and specifically um, in par a partnership with WHO for use with uh, women in low income countries. So. Um, I uh, was just telling Roger um, and you that I've been following this development of this uh, ring for, gosh, decade and a half now, um, but our uh, readers won't know about it. So tell us a bit to start off with about the development of the vaginal ring um, and why it's still, given all the other developments that have taken place since needed. Right. Well, it certainly is still needed, although we have been working on this for uh, a good 16 years. Um, it is certainly still as relevant as it was when we began. And that is unfortunate because women, it means that women are still at very high risk of HIV infection throughout the world, and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we developed the ring to address that gap in the HIV prevention portfolio which was that women did not have a method that they could use on their own terms discreetly. Um, and so that was the genesis for the development of the ring. Um, the drug that is in the ring, that is the HIV prevention drug, um, is Depivirine, um, which was licensed to us from uh, Johnson & Johnson. And, um, and we have worldwide rights to that, to that drug. And it is a very safe and um, uh, inexpensive drug because one of the main hallmarks of, of our effort to develop a product was that it be affordable and accessible to women um, in resource poor settings. And so this is a flexible silicone ring which slowly releases an antiretroviral drug which is Japivirine and it um, uh, reduces the risk of HIV infection uh, for women who use it and hopefully consistently <laughs> throughout the month. And um, then the woman replaces the ring uh, with a new ring. Uh, so a woman, it is under her own terms. She inserts the ring, she re removes the ring, um, and it doesn't require um, uh, a, the taking um, a, a daily method. Um, so it's something that for women who can't or won't use a daily method, it is something that they can use um, for a month at a time. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the two studies where, um, with the two efficacy studies that uh, the ring went through? Right. So um, these studies were done in uh, four countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and they were conducted in many of the same sites that the uh, oral Truvada um, efficacy studies were conducted, same populations of women. And we were able to show um, approximately a 30% risk reduction overall. Um, and that includes women in the trial who didn't use the ring at all, and women in the trial who used it consistently, and women in the trial who used it intermittently. Um, so from my perspective, um, uh, the efficacy could be higher um, when used consistently, if everyone uses it consistently. But the data from the study are the data that is scientifically validated. Um, so 30% reduction is what is um, between those two studies. Um, for the ring study alone, it is a 35% reduction um, in, in uh, HIV risk. Mm -hmm. When those same women had been, or not those same women, but women in similar um, circumstances had been followed during the HIV um, um, Truvada prevention trials, uh, no efficacy was seen. And again, and that was not because Truvada didn't work very well, it's because it wasn't used. And so effectiveness is a combination of efficacy and adherence. And unless everyone uses the product consistently and perfectly, we won't know how efficacious it is. Yes, indeed. Um, 
So obviously, um, the fact that it's not, you know, the, the, the studies didn't show efficacy as great as some of the PrEP studies did um, is interesting. Um, and it's been some time since the studies con con concluded. Is this why it took a while to, to get it approved? Well, um, no, it, it takes a long time in many, in many cases to get trials approved. Um, we have been under review by the EMA for about three years. Um, they are, you know, they did a very rigorous evaluation um, of the data and um, took a little longer than we would have liked, but we are very pleased uh, with the outcome. And, and you mentioned that it is not as efficacious as the early PrEP studies. Yeah. IPREX, um, the original um, uh, study of Truvada in, in men who have sex with men in the US had about a 42% efficacy, mm. which is not far off from 35%. Mm. And then when you went into the open label studies, that efficacy went up because people then felt more comfortable knowing the safety and efficacy of the product. And when we did our open label extensions, um, similarly, there was greater adherence to the product um, we are hampered by the lack of a control group, clearly, in an open label extension study, because that would be unethical at that point in time. So we estimated the incidence that would have been in a placebo group if you looked at the age, composition, and background rates of STIs, and came up with a number that we felt was a reasonably conservative number for incidence. And then if you compared what we saw in the open label extension study, it was about a 60% protection. We feel that the open label extension um, did um, show certainly greater adherence and we think greater efficacy, but again, um, there are limitations to those designs. Okay. Um, Roger, do you want to ask about the EMA registration? And Thanks, Gus. Um, I think one thing that some people may be interested in is I think, yeah, why, why are you going through the EMA rather than WHO or FD, FDA? And yeah, does it, does it mean that the product can be available in Europe? Because I understand the main focus so far is on Africa. Right. We did not seek a marketing authorization in Europe. We um, sought a positive, we sought a scientific opinion from the EMA under what's called Article 58 which is a process that only EMA has, and the um, FDA does not have a similar process, that they will review a, um, a drug dossier with the same um, rigor that they do a marketing application in Europe, but solely for the purpose of marketing outside um, Europe in resource poor settings. And they involve WHO um, as a partner in that review which is really important because then it helps facilitate the WHO involvement that usually happens afterwards, which is um, guidelines for use, pre-qualification, all of those steps that African regulatory agencies want to see before they will consider reviewing a product. And so it helps streamline that process. It's not sequential. It almost happens in parallel. So we are very hopeful that um, uh, guidelines and pre-qualification um, could be available as early as the end of this year, maybe by first quarter of next year. Um, in parallel, we will start um, submitting um, uh, our dossier to African uh, governments under a collaborative review mechanism with WHO. And then hopefully by sometime as early as possible in 2021, we can have um, the ring available to women somewhere in Africa. So we're, that, that's our goal. So tell us about distribution. How, what, what have we got set up in order to well, get the ring into women's yeah. hands? Yeah, well first, in order to distribute a product, you have to have the product. And so we have <laughs> um, a, a great partner in manufacturing, Q Pharma in Sweden. Uh, we've already been working with them on the plans for marketing. Of, uh, of, of, of manufacturing more and more rings. And so um, that switch has already been flipped and they are beginning um, the manufacturing. One of the nice things about the ring um, among many is that it has um, at least a four year shelf life, if not five years. Oh. And 
So we can be manufacturing rings as we go and, and keeping them in a warehouse and not worrying about expiration date initially. So we will be doing that and uh, making sure that we have enough rings. Um, and then increases in volume can be handled. Um, we already have that all worked out. Um, we are gonna partner clearly. IPM is a very small group. Um, we are in product development, but we clearly know the most about the ring at this point but we will be partnering with many of the important players in the field of um, social marketing and distribution. Um, and luckily, we are following on to a long um, uh, history of, uh, of groups that have now a lot of experience in getting products out there. That leads on to, very logically, to the question I was then going to ask, which was, um, uh, you know, it, even with um, really consistent use, it's not as intrinsically as efficacious as oral prep. If we're talking about 60%, I've seen 67%, perhaps a bit more comparable with uh, medical male circumcision, for instance. So what messages are, is it going to be uh, mm -hmm. marketed with? We're not, perhaps we're less used than we used to be to um, a partially effective prevention method. Mm -hmm. um, Will it need to be used alongside other prevention methods, I presume so? What are we going to say about it? Well, inherently, we don't know the efficacy of the ring. Um, we know that it can't be as effective as oral prep for all forms of sexual transmission. So if a woman is having anal sex, clearly the vaginal ring will not be working. Um, and Truvada would clearly be the drug of choice. And in fact, the EMA, and I'm assuming WHO will recommend this as well, but I do not know, will say that the ring should be used when oral prep isn't or cannot be used or is not available. So the first recommendation to a woman, because oral prep covers all forms of transmission, should be use oral prep. If a woman says, I've tried it, I don't like it, or I don't want to use it, or do you really have it here? If she decides not to use it, then um, the ring can be um, offered. And so for us, it is a hierarchy. And for both oral prep and the ring, both of those products are recommended for use with condoms. So um, yes, we, we certainly, um, we know that if Truvada isn't used consistently and correctly, there is a risk of transmission. We know that if the ring is not used consistently and correctly, there is a risk of transmission. So we certainly need to have backup methods. And if women can use condoms, they should use condoms. Um, so, and I think hopefully when um, injectable cab is available, which we all hope it will be, um, there will be more options for people. Um, and, and that really is the goal here is to have more options so that women can choose something they can use consistently and correctly. Okay. okay, I gather a couple of things. Firstly, I gather that they're asking for more data on young women, but secondly, also you've got other further developments yes. of this in the pipeline, haven't you? Yes, yes. So the EMA did, did ask us to do um, uh, an additional study um, uh, after, I mean, we can roll the ring out, but to try to get additional data specifically in 18 to 25 year olds. Um, we know that adherence was not as good in that group and therefore efficacy um, could not be as good in that group. Um, so the real goal, and I think this is important for every prevention option, is to try to figure out how to encourage young people to adhere to whatever prevention modality yeah. exists. Yes, um, so I think it's very important um, to look at that um, for the ring. And we have a three monthly ring. So the, the ring that was just um, given a positive scientific opinion is a one monthly ring. We have a three monthly ring in development. And that I think would be important for people who can adhere to a ring. You got to adhere to it in order to be able to have the three monthly ring work better than a one month ring. But it could be much um, better for a woman and less costly to donors, which I think is going to be another important factor um, for access. And then we also have a three month combination HIV prevention contraception ring. Um, mm. And that to us could be really important, especially for young women. Yes, because I gather that that way you may reach um, young women who may not think that an HIV prevention ring is 
something they need that they might be right. interested in the contraceptive one. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Um, Roger, anything else you'd like to ask? Just one last thought, which is about other topical methods of prevention. You mentioned multi-purpose ring. Do you think, are there any other avenues in terms of topical prevention for women, which um, still very much need to be explored? I think implants are really, really important. Um, I think, you know, any, any um, uh, delivery system that has been used for contraception that women are familiar with um, would be an ideal delivery for both HIV prevention as well as dual method. And I know there's a lot of work going on on a dual method pill um, for both contraception and HIV prevention. Again, that would be a great option um, for women who can't adhere to a pill. Maybe a ring would be a good idea. Um, um, maybe there could be a combination injectable. Um, so there are lots of, of ideas here. And of course, not just HIV and contraception, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could figure out how to prevent other STIs as, as um, you know, cofactors in transmission? Yeah, and there is some research being done on that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Thank you very much for talking to us. It's lovely to see you again, even if through it's Zoom. Lovely to see you too. <laughs> and it's really nice to be able Goodness to um, talk about progress. <laughs>